Good morning and thank you to the organizers for asking me to speak today. We'll briefly cover the effects of HIV, art, and aging on both muscle and fat. So just in, as a brief overview, we're going to start the, the talk speaking about adipose tissue and adiposity in people living with HIV, including weight gain on art. We'll then move on to talk about muscle. And mixed in along the way, we'll talk about the effects of aging virus and antiretroviral effects on both of these tissue depots. And finally, I'll close with some take home points. So just as background, aging, HIV, and ART are all associated with changes in muscle and fat, as this audience well knows. They're also associated with the development of cardiometabolic disease, which is you know, the ultimate reason that we care about the tissue level changes. But the intersection of these is still not fully understood. As time has gone on, our knowledge of the virus of specific effects has improved, as has our knowledge of ART effects, although the effects of art really have evolved as art has evolved, such that we've gone from focusing on lipodystrophy and mitochondrial dysfunction to with more modern art, the problems of generalized weight gain, more subclinical adipose tissue changes, as well as lipid and glucose abnormalities and the risk of cardiovascular disease. So how may HIV and art affect adipose tissue function? First, they induce a pro-inflammatory environment with immunologic dysregulation. Second, there's suppression of PPAR gamma with altered lipid and glucose metabolism at the tissue level. Third, both HIV and ART, specifically protease inhibitors, have been documented to stimulate the re-angiotensin system. And fourth, fat is a reservoir or sanctuary site for HIV. This is due both in part to early seeding of the adipose tissue by HIV early in infection and due to low ART penetration by some classes of agents. And clinically, when we're thinking about adipose tissue dysfunction, there are three intersecting syndromes. So we're all familiar with lipoatrophy, lipohypertrophy, and visceral fat accumulation, as well as generalized obesity. And increasingly, especially as our population is aging, we're seeing overlaps in these clinical syndromes. Additionally, HIV and antiretroviral therapy have to be layered on top to provide where they cause additional effects in the tissues that complicate our understanding of both these clinical syndromes and how they may be treated. So what are the virus specific effects in the adipose tissue that lead to metabolic defects? In untreated HIV, there's a catabolic state characterized by wasting, increased triglycerides and LDL cholesterol and low HDL cholesterol as well as mitochondrial dysfunction and depletion, adipose tissue inflammation, and insulin resistance. These viral effects persist during ART due to the presence of viral protein R, or VPR. In fact, replication competent virus or intact virions are not needed to trigger these metabolic effects at the tissue level, simply the presence of VPR. So during early HIV infection, the tissue is seeded with whether or not there's replication competent viruses doesn't matter. The presence of the viral protein in the fat long term leads to these consequences, which are primarily suppression of adipose tissue PPAR gamma and glucocorticoid receptor activation, as well as macrophage and T cell infiltration into the adipose tissue, creating a pro inflammatory environment, stimulation of apoptosis and lipolysis. And these viral effects may differ by sex. There are estrogen receptors in the fat, and some data exist um, to support the hypothesis that viral effects uh, differ through estrogen receptor modulation. However, the complete mechanisms of these have not been worked out. What we do know is that HIV's metabolic effects are mediated through inflammatory pathways. So this figure primarily shows what happens with obesity. Moving from left to right, you see that uh, fat tissue goes from regular round adipocytes with a small lip lipid droplet to large engorged adipocytes with irregular lipid droplets this is a highly pro-inflammatory state that the cells are under a lot of stress. They send out distress signals, which causes influx of immune cells, uh, release of cytokines that ultimately cause tissue inflammation, tissue hypoxia, necrosis of the adipocytes, and metabolic dysfunction marked by insulin resistance, lipolysis, and free fatty acid release. HIV, in fact, mirrors these tissue level effects um, but what we don't know is whether HIV and obesity, those effects at the tissue level are synergistic, additive, et cetera. 
want to briefly touch on lipoatrophy such that really we're talking about its relevance and as a legacy effect in persons exposed to thymidine analog NRTIs. So the fat wasting and mitochondrial dysfunction that are characteristic of these agents is associated with a pro-inflammatory tissue environment and adipose tissue fibrosis, which subsequently leads to dysfunction. And since most of these changes are irreversible, persons who were exposed to them in the past are still suffering from these effects. And any new art effects or any new weight gain effects have to be layered on top of these. And indeed, in the MAX cohort, men with thymidine analog exposure had significantly more metabolic syndrome components after adjusting for other contributors. And then we have to just think about generalized obesity. We are going to talk in a minute about weight gain with ART initiation, but as you can see in the left-hand panel from a cohort in the southern United States, in some areas, significant portions of people living with HIV are overweight or obese before they even start antiretroviral therapy. Here, it's well over 50%. And then we know we're going to start ART and people are going to continue to gain weight and we're going to exacerbate these traditional obesity-related problems. A second factor is how people gain weight. This is illustrated on the right. If you are not overweight or obese at the time you initiate antiretroviral therapy, we don't know how you are going to gain weight. We can't predict whether it will be central weight with the Apple or Android distribution that's associated with more cardiovascular disease, or if persons will be more likely to gain weight in the gynoid distribution. But what we ultimately worry about is primarily expansion of the visceral adipose tissue depot. This leads to tissue effects that we've already explained. Um, but ultimately, once the lo local tissue level function is disrupted, there's release into the systemic circulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines, hormones, and free fatty acids that affect a variety of other tissues, including skeletal muscle, the heart, and liver, leading to insulin resistance other lipid abnormalities, and ultimately cardiovascular disease. So a better understanding of how adipose tissue function changes with HIV, ART, and aging is needed to prevent cardiovascular disease in people living with HIV. So I'm going to briefly touch on weight gain on ART because a lot of new data has come out recently. And here you can see in the left-hand panel data from the advanced trial showing compared to standard of care, which is uh, treatment with Tenofovir, disoprosyl fumarate, and tricitabine and efavirenz in blue, persons treated with dolutegravir instead of efavirenz had significantly more weight gain. And then the additional substitution of tenofovir, alafenamide, or TAF for TDF led to an even greater weight gain in persons over 96 weeks. This was especially true for women. On the right-hand side, this is a summary of randomized controlled trials from Gilead. And you can see in the upper left-hand panel that persons treated with integrase inhibitors did have significantly more weight gain in red than persons treated with PI or NRTI over 96 weeks of therapy. In the lower left-hand panel, broken down by integrase inhibitor, dolutegravir and bictegravir seem to have similar trajectories of weight gain compared to a lower weight gain with elvitegravir. And this has been demonstrated in multiple studies. And in comparison, as a reference point on the right-hand side of the panel, we see the weight gain uh, observed with ropivirine and efavirenz in the upper right, and on the lower right, the com contributions of the various nucleoside uh, backbone components, again, with tenofovir alafenamide uh, being associated with the greatest weight gain. And these represent uh, the bulk of the data that has, is emerging fairly well. What's important and relevant to this talk is people ask, well, how do we know what this weight is? So the advanced trial had DEXAs that were taken um, along with study visits at, throughout the 96 weeks. And here we see in the yellow and gold what for both men and women that most of the weight gain was primarily fat gain. In persons treated with dolutegravir, there was some limb lean mass gain and trunk lean mass gain seen in salmon and pink. However, with efavirenz, there was essentially no lean mass gain after ART initiation. But in, in general, most weight gain is fat gain. And indeed, this is believed to have clinical consequences. The same participants in the advanced trial saw more than a doubling of their risk of metabolic syndrome over 96 weeks in persons treated with dolutegravir and TAF compared to efavirenz. This did not reach statistical significance when separated by sex. But I will tell you that I think this is probably a power issue because if you look at the actual 
percentages, you see again at least a doubling of the risk of metabolic syndrome over 96 weeks in persons treated with dolutegravir and TAF compared to TDF and efavirenz. So how may ART and HIV affect muscle function? First, it promotes deposition of fat into the muscles, decreasing muscle quality. It reduces muscle aerobic capacity, particularly in people on ART compared to persons living with HIV who are either not on ART or and HIV negative persons. There's reduced oxidative enzyme activity and increased muscle oxidative stress. Interesting, there's no change in skeletal muscle fiber composition or number as with, occurs with age, at least in the short term. And we'll see these data in more detail, but basically this is telling us that the quantity of lean mass is not decreasing at a greater rate in persons with HIV, but the quality is significantly changing and in fact worsening. And this, is, this can be shown and we'll see uh, on some pathology slides by internalized myonuclei with reduced nuclear PPAR gamma coactivator expression, which are both two markers of premature aging of the muscle. So here in the left-hand panel, we see on the x-axis two markers of muscle function, the peak VO2 and production of ATP. And regardless of the measure, if your mitochondrial function is worse, your walking speed is slower. And on the right, we see an algorithm for how this might happen, such that aging causes loss of muscle mass. Loss of muscle mass from aging leads to decreased aerobic capacity, shown by VO2 peak, and loss of mitochondrial capacity and efficiency. Those functional deficits then lead to reduced walking speed. And of course, reduced functional capacity learns leads to reduced mobility and disability and mortality, as we well know. HIV and ART, though, come in again at the muscle function level, contributing an additional detriment to walking speed. And here are the biopsy data that I alluded to earlier. We see on the left hand panel A, the red staining, which is that PGC1 expression. And in panel D, right below it, uh, the the fact that the HIV positive participants had lower PGC1 levels than the HIV negative participants. In panel B, we see the staining of the muscle nuclei in red, most of which are at the periphery of the cells, as you can see. But there are nuclei in the middle of the cells, which is illustrated with the orange circle. Nuclei should not be in the middle of the muscle cells. This is very atypical. And so you can see in panel E that the HIV positive participants did in fact have significantly more internalized nuclei than persons without HIV. And on the far right hand column, this is showing that there's no difference in collagen, which uh, excess of collagen deposition can lead to fibrosis of the tissues. In this particular cohort, there was no difference by HIV serostatus and collagen deposition, but the two markers of premature aging the PGC1 and internalized myonuclei were disrupted in persons with HIV. Coming back to our point about functional impairment with age, with ART and HIV, rather than muscle quantity loss, this is a short-term study over five years of people living with HIV by gender compared to HIV negative controls. And you can see particularly for men that the HIV positive men started out with less muscle mass overall, but that the rate of decline of muscle mass was essentially the same um, for the men with and without HIV, and a similar finding in the women. So uh, the age-related component of muscle quantity loss seemed to be about the same and did not differ by HIV serostatus. What does happen, though, is people living with HIV are more likely to have fatty muscle because both age and art contribute to fatty muscle, which leads to loss of muscle function. In the panel on the right from Christine Erlinson and colleagues, you can see as people age, those with HIV have significantly fattier muscles than those without HIV in blue. This is evidenced by thigh muscle density from CT in which lower density means a fattier muscle. So those lower values as you approach age 70 were much, reflected much fattier muscles and the older HIV positive men. And then in the panel on the right, we see 
uh, again, what is the composition of the muscle? After initiating antiretroviral therapy, we see significant increases in total muscle area, so muscle quantity. But in figure 1b, no change in lean muscle area, which means the changes in muscle area related to antiretroviral therapy initiation were related to increases in fat in the muscle. So let's put it all together. We know, and this is data from Giovanni Garaldi's cohort in Modena, that fat gain and lean loss is the rule in HIV. It's also somewhat the rule in aging. But we know, again, from other studies, particularly this one with Phil Grant's group, um, that this can be greater than expected for age. So in the top panel, this is specific to fat. Uh, you see in blue fat gain uh, with antiretroviral therapy initiation in people living with HIV that does not plateau over a number of years. It keeps increasing and is much greater than the fat gain that occurs in persons from the general population in red. So this is uh, indeed greater fat gain than expected for age while on suppressive antiretroviral therapy. And the potential implications of this are pretty significant and the increased fat mass and decreased lean mass uh, and increased fatty muscle increased risk for obesity, sarcopenia, and their complications, uh, particularly sarcopenic obesity. And we'll talk about that more on the next slide. So how may HIV art, aging, and obesity interplay to contribute to sarcopenic obesity? Well, I think it's, this is a nice figure because you see at the top the effects of aging on the left and obesity on the right, uh, whether it be disruption of metabolic rate, hypogonadism, or with obesity, fat accumulation and insulin resistance. These then uh, affect the function of this, both the muscle and the fat, uh, leading to reduction in muscle quantity and aberrant adipose tissue function. Um, and weight gain costs leading to sarcopenic obesity, which we know that from the general population is associated with increased mortality compared to having sarcopenia or low muscle mass or obesity alone. And HIV and ART, as we've just talked about, play into both the muscle and tissue function here. So again, it's a scenario where we're laying on top of age and obesity related issues, the contributors of the virus and of our therapies. I just want to highlight that sarcopenic obesity is, is defining the relationship between muscle mass and obesity, but there may be a better measure for people living with HIV, particularly since we just talked about how HIV and ART affect the muscle quality and not the muscle quantity, and that would be dynapenic obesity. And dynapenic obesity is the relationship between the muscle quality and obesity, um, and these are actually defined using things that are available in clinical practice, such as hand grip strength and waist circumference, whereas sarcopenic obesity is, uh, requires more of a research analysis with a quantification of muscle mass by imaging. Uh, determination of dynapenic obesity is something that you can do in the clinic. And we see the Venn diagram here showing us that some people may be sarcopenic and dynapenic. They may have low muscle mass and poor quality muscles, but you can be in either category separately. And so since HIV and ART are affecting muscle quality more, perhaps the dynapenic spectrum is a place for us to better assess functional relationships in our folks living with HIV. So just some take home points, Aging, weight gain, HIV, and ART all contribute to morbidity and mortality in people living with HIV, but the mechanistic intersections are only beginning to be understood. The virus-specific effects on muscle and fat are independent of virologic suppression, so alternative therapeutic targets may be needed. We see that there is a risk for excessive weight gain for some people on integrase inhibitors and tenofovir alafenamide but the therapeutic strategies to treat or avoid this have not yet been determined. And the benefit of using these agents may ultimately outweigh risk. So we really need to see where this research goes. And then finally, fat gain and lean mass loss in people living with HIV on ART may combine with age-related changes in these tissue depots to increase the risk for sarcopenic or dynapenic obesity and its sequelae. And with that, I would like to thank you.